Many of you may have seen a small, quiet film that was released in the last few weeks called The Force Awakens, um, brackets, episode seven. The desert scenes in this small indie film that no one's heard of um, were filmed in Abu Dhabi, and this is the, the neighboring emirate to Dubai, and also the capital of the United Arab Emirates. A long, long time ago, 38 years to be precise, uh, episode four, yes, the whole thing is very confusing, uh, also known as Star Wars, was filmed in Tunisia, and fragments of Luke Skywalker's home remain there for pilgrims to visit. So that phrase, a long, long time ago. The deep past, says Asad Raza, is a form of science fiction, or it's the deep future. And it often looked like, or will look like, the desert. Sophia Almaria, our next guest, partly grew up in, or close to the deserts in Qatar. Her, fa her father's family, a Bedouin family, who, like many Gulf families in the 20th, late 20th century, jump cut from desert to shopping mall in mere years, or just a decade or two. It's all there in her fiction memoir, which is called The Girl Who Fell to Earth, whose title invokes David Bowie as Thomas Jerome Newton in the, ninth, in the great, great science fiction film, The Man Who Fell to Earth, directed by Nicholas Rogue. Sophia is an artist, a writer, and a filmmaker, and she's even known to t travel through time and space as uh, sci-fi Wahhabi. So before I ask her to come up and join us, um, we're going to show uh, a brand new film essay that Sophia has l finished literally today um, as, uh, uh, as, a, as a response to this theme. Uh, and it's part one, and part two will be, uh, will be unveiled in, uh, in Dubai in, the, uh, in March in the Global Art Forum. So if we could please play the video and turn the lights down. Thank you very much. does 
he dedicates to all of mankind. A species whose very first leap began in the vicinity of this shadow. This signals the symbolic end, the full stop. Our first markings have managed the journey through time to witness some of the last. But what can lie ahead? This we are particularly skilled at imagining. And the answer lies here, stacked at the same latitude, is the desert called Nineveh. This is the human future, as seen from the early 21st century. A horror show of blood bags and guzzoline, where the earth is sour and the green place is nothing but a single petrified tree. In this story, popular imagining makes rare coupling with unpopular fact. We have committed planetary suicide. Earth is really dying. Once upon a time, we did not exist. And someday, we will cease to again. The absence of us is the only thing that can define the future with any certainty. All that we will leave behind are crude drawings scoured by sand, and a tangled knot of fiber optic wire at the bottom of the sea. And all this will say to those who are coming is that for a brief flurry in the incomprehensible abyss of geological time, we were here. That one's yours. I uh, hope nobody expected the Boney M. Uh, it's a new discovery. The Boney M were closet apocalypticists. Yeah, very cheerful apocalyptic. <laughs> it's half half ballad, half disco. Weird. <laughs> well, my first question is whether you are a, a, a pessimist or an apo apocalypticist. The two are not. Um, the two are not the same, it's true. Uh, it's a very good question. I get called a pessimist a lot. Um, Do you take it as a compliment? I, uh, I'm proud to be a pessimist, but it's not very good for one's mental health. <laughs> I don't recommend it. If there was uh, an optimism pill, would you take it? Absolutely not. <laughs> Although it might be fun to be happy for a while. <laughs> <laughs> One hour of happiness, Sophia. Could you bear it? Yes, I yes. think so. Okay. I'll save so that for the end. We have to move through literally thousands of uh, years of uh, desert-related uh, things now in about 10 minutes. Um, so this is, uh, this is accelerationist time travel. Maybe we start right at the, right at the beginning uh, before we... Oh, move into and through your, through your film. Um, one of the things we, we realized last night when we were talking about this was that the, the definition or the meaning of the word desert has changed somewhat, and that change is quite recent. Yes. Could, you, could you tell us what, what that change has been and what, what it was before and what do you think it's become now? Well, in the English language, if you look at the etymology of desert, um, it, was, it did not always sort of refer to the climate science aspect of the desert being a um, very arid place. It referred more to loneliness and um, un uninhabited places. 
I think that that was really what I was responding to. I mean, getting the subject desert, I felt like a tiny bug on the back of the subject because I'm not a scientist and I'm not sort of, um, on so many different levels, it's this vast expanse to get lost in and possibly die in. So um, I uh, just decided to go with the ancient past, the deep history element, and of course, once Earth was uninhabited. And um, so, and yeah. the other thing we were, we're talking about, obviously that the, we're talking about um, this word desert, which has, uh, which exists in the various main you know, Western European uh, languages and basically means the same thing, uh, uh, an abandoned place or a place um, with, uh, which is uninhabited, which now has a new kind of geological um, connotation, which is low precipitation, right? But I was wondering what um, the Arabic words for desert um, are and whether they, they're the same or do they connote something else? Well, um, I grew up calling the desert Al Bar, so like the sort of wilderness. Um, it's just one way, but I mean, the Sahara is the word for desert. And um, of course, in English, we have adopted that. It is sort of um, moved. It's one of the borrowings from Arabic, mm -hmm. um, the name of the Sahara. Um, but I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm, again, caveat, I'm not a linguist, so. Uh, yeah, I was dealing with this subject very much in a sort of like hypertext manner of leaping around and getting little snippets of things from different disciplines and fields to get a feel. And that, that, that business of um, bef kind of deep beforeness and deep afterness, before I, we get into um, science fiction and, and films, you, the film start, your film starts with, um, I guess, some very early um, examples of cave, cave art or cave drawings or cave paintings. And um, could, you, could you say something about their relationship to the, to the, to the desert and also to this notion of, uh, I guess, of time travel? Um, my interest in in rock art and cave painting um, was really stoked recently because I spent three months in South Africa mm -hmm. um, and, in the, and the first two weeks of which was um, on the border with Namibia where they shot Mad Max, Fur Fury Road, the best movie of last year. I don't know why you're talking about The Force Awakens. <laughs> that is not the future. Um, no, I love it. but. Um, and there, that is the location of a lot of um, um, sand rock art. And I thought that that was, a, originally I thought that that would be a really good entry point because not only is that some of the oldest art in the world, but also the um, sand people are, mm. they hold the oldest um, sort of common Y chromosome of all of, human kind and so um, it seemed appropriate to sort of begin at the origins of where it is believed our species began um, and so in terms of the time travel element of that I can't think of any I mean we we have we haven't had the luxury of testing anything that we've built to see if it will last you know over a few thousand years so we'll have to see if mm anything other than ochre and um, chalk and ground up ostrich egg will last longer than our rocket ships. I suppose our satellites. Satellites. But we can barely use floppy disks anymore, right? Well, I still use them. <laughs> you still use them? As yeah. earrings. Yeah. <laughs> um, so about film, why, why is the future in film often a desert? It's uh, cheap to film in. It's cheap to film in. It's a ready-made set, that's Sorry, it. Sorry, didn't mean to be facetious. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, you look at like science fiction covers, right? 
Like, so there's so many wonderful depictions of strange desert planets with sort of tentacled beasts for some reason living in the desert. And um, I think that that probably is, the answer to that is very simple. You know, sort of Mars is a desert, the moon is a desert. Those are sort of the landscapes that we could see from a telescope. Mm. Um, so the only sort of analog to that on Earth is the desert, you know, of like actual landscapes in outer space. Do you um, think, do you think um, Dune was kind of instrumental in setting that up? Or do you think that Dune is already part of a tradition? I think uh, there was already a tradition of, of desert planets. I mean, there's so many wonderful examples of desert planets in the sort of pantheon of SF. Um, Arrakis is, of course, very important, but you also have, I mean, Vulcan is a desert planet, and Tatooine is a desert planet, just to cite some famous ones. Um, but... Are they I your, mean, would they be your favorite future landscapes? Um, I actually think, I mean, I, I am very partial to that, but I, my, one of my favorite future landscapes is from the drowned world, and that's London, hmm. underwater. Underwater. <laughs> So, I mean, um, there's something very primal about uh, the desert, but equally sort of getting into those primordial fears. Um, a flooded landscape, a swamp is, is also pretty scary. I and, like scary sci-fi. And talking about then uh, lived science fiction, um, Gulf futurism, which is a term that you're uh, you're often um, associated with, or perhaps even certainly coined. Um, maybe for those people in the audience who aren't familiar with the term, you could say something about what are the kind of quintessential characteristics of Gulf futurism, but also importantly, what role does the desert play in that, in that formulation or that imagination? All right. Um, I, I get asked a lot to, to, to sort of explain it. You must have it down to a... Well, to a T. it's because um, one of the reasons, the thing I want to say about it, defining it, is that I always thought of it not as a sort of description of aesthetics of what is happening in the Gulf, but quite the opposite. The thought that the Gulf is a projection of our collective future, and desertification is a really big part of that. Um, of course, several people have already mentioned climate change, but I think that because the Gulf is going to be... Um, uninhabitable, supposedly, by 2050, because of increasing temperatures. Um, it's, in a way, the sort of tip of the iceberg for the entire planet. Should it um, go back to desert as it once was in the 19th century and previous sort of iterations of the word desert? <laughs> should it become uninhabitable again? Um, the Gulf is an example of that, and so that is how I define Gulf futurism, mm. although others probably define it in other ways. And, well, I mean, one of, I think one of the shorthand ways in which Gulf futurism often gets denoted, so if we think of those images from that Watad had put together, these real estate uh, uh, adverts, marketing uh, images, is, is a kind of uh, uh, a, a sort of intense eruption of uh, glass and steel clad skyscrapers in a desert context, right? So, and, the, and what's interesting about that, of course, is glass, silica, sand, desert. Exactly. Right? So. They are all sort of, they birth each other. It's a sort of perfect circle. Um, I think so the day I find sort of natural glass the whole, you can imagine that the entire gulf would then turn to a sort of crystal world. Um, melting in the sun. It'll be very beautiful. Pessimist, really? <laughs> Apocalypse? We'll do a vote. Um, so we're running out of time. I uh, just a couple of, uh, one last question. Um, something you must know, but I thought it was interesting to, to be reminded of this, was that the, the code names of the gulf, Gulf War I, back in 1990-91. So the, the initial uh, deployment of troops uh, in Saudi was called Desert Shield, and then the actual uh, invasion of Iraq was Desert Storm. 
Um, and one of the, for me, that was, um, I really remember that uh, moment because something very futuristic happened, which was the invasion, the, the bombing, the explosions in the sky were transmitted live on CNN. Uh, and in particular, using night vision, this, this incredible green, uh, and, you know, are these fireworks? No, that I means pe people being um, blitzed away. Um, and then, you know, later Jean Baudrillard kind of said the Gulf War did not take place. And this, I find the, the, the code names, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and, and the fact that the Gulf War won was, it felt like a future, a futuristic war. Could you say something about that and where, where you were at that time? Um, I was not in the Gulf, um, but I, I think that that Baudrillard book, it's the desert of the unreal, I think, that you're quoting or talking about, um, was really, uh, I think, prescient to the sort of world that we're living, to the internet and sort of how we experience events now. Um, it's a sort of, I guess, a rubric through which to, s to think critically about our relationship to images of violence and the, our sort of distance from them. And again, like bec um, the sort of isolation of the desert and the way in which we experience war if we are not, if we are so lucky as to not be um, inside of it, um, is, is increasingly a desert. It's a sort of desert of the soul um, mediated by our screens. And um, yeah, I mean, these sort of like military monikers for actions are um, there's it's almost like there's a there's a w word cloud of things that can be used and they just get sort of realigned for example gulf shield um, and so these um, desert is a yeah appropriate it's simply an adjective <laughs> for the situation i suppose and it's, I guess it's also weirdly, it's weirdly literal considering how often code names are really obscure and strange. Mm -hmm. I never really thought about it before. So, last question, uh, without giving too much away about part two, does it have a happy ending? Um, I can't promise one, but it's it's certainly more lush. I'm quick. Like, who would like first? Hands up. Who would like a happy ending? You miserable fuckers. <laughs> My people. Okay, keep on doing what you keep on doing, Sophia. Uh, please join me in thanking Sophia Almeria. Thank you. <laughs>